the exact same date all the time. They will always target March and September, Patch Tuesdays. Windows tends to be a little bit more wishy-washy, so there can be some variations in the window release schedule, but generally we try to keep them as close together as possible. That gives you some options. You can deploy Windows and Office updates together, or you might choose to stagger them. But at the very least, you know that you're going to have this particular rhythm, and we want you to do consistently the same thing uh, every six months as you're releasing these. So when we look at this from a process perspective, this really isn't the same as what you've done in the past where you did a deployment project every three to five years. This is much more continual. You will always be working on planning and preparing for the next release that's coming out. We're already preparing for the next release that's coming out next year. We're doing insider preview builds. We're showing new features. We're providing new functionality. You're probably then going to be piloting a release that just came out, like Windows 10 1709. That's been out now for a couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully, you're already looking at it and getting ready to deploy that in your organization. And then there's probably a third release that's in use inside of your organization that you're either still broadly deploying or using on a significant number of machines. So you're always going to be looking at three different releases of Windows at all times one that you're using, one that you're piloting, one that you're evaluating to see what's coming next. And that roughly corresponds to the phases that we can see on the diagram. Every new release, you want to be seeing what's coming next. You then want to move to targeted deployments to, say, 10 to 20% of the devices in your organization, and then open it up for the broad population. Because you're doing this continually, it's not really a project anymore. It's just an ongoing process that you implement to get this uh, flowing inside of your organization. When we look at this more broadly, we're doing this for every product that we have at Microsoft. We've moved to a much more frequent release cycle for everything to get you more capabilities faster. We don't want to sit on new capabilities and new features for three to five years and then say, here's the new bundle, because you don't get any value in that three to five year period. But even more importantly, security is a big deal. And providing new security features every th three to five years just doesn't work anymore. So we've had to move to these more frequent release cadences to make sure that you can continue to get those additional security capabilities to try to stay ahead of the bad guys. Obviously, at the same time, we're moving to a more cloud-based infrastructure and providing more uh, components to integrate between Windows and Office running on the client and cloud services that we have running in Azure and, and other places. So uh, it really becomes a, a key cycle for us to make sure that we can deliver these capabilities much more quickly. When we look at Config Manager, uh, it's important to understand, too, the, it, the interaction between the different Config Manager releases and the Windows and Office releases when they come out. Config Manager moved to their own as-a-service model. So they have the Config Manager current branch, where they're releasing new Config Manager releases three times per year, about every four months. To support Windows 10 and the releases that come out for it, you need to make sure that you're running the most recent Config Manager current branch release at the point when Windows was released because it's going to have basic compatibility support. So you can always look backwards to the previous Config Manager release and know that it will provide manageability for Windows 10. The next Config Manager release after that then adds full support for the new Windows 10 features that have been added in that Windows release. Config Manager doesn't predict what features are going to be coming. Instead, they focus on compatibility initially, and then with the next release after that, they would add new support for Windows 10 features that were added. So in this case, Config Manager 1706 provides compatibility with Windows 10 1709. Config Manager 1710 then starts to add new Windows 10 functionality. When we look at productivity, 
when we delivered capabilities every three to five years, we had these big spikes where we would impact the end user pretty significantly. They would have to relearn Windows. There was a pretty significant change as we went from Windows XP to Windows 7 and now to Windows 10. But as we're doing these smaller releases every six months, we don't run into that anymore. We can provide new capabilities and new features every six months, and the delta between the previous release is going to be smaller. So as a result, we think that the end users will be able to much more easily adapt to those changes. So you don't have to worry so much about end user training for each of these, that the changes are going to be much smaller, that they'll be much more natural for the end user so that they don't need any significant retraining for each release. That makes it less disruptive overall, makes it less costly overall, and makes it just kind of that kind of continual process that I had talked about before. From a security perspective, when we did releases every three to five years, we added security capabilities every three to five years. And those security capabilities would then stay pretty much locked for the next three to five years while that release was the primary operating system in use. That led to these protection gaps where the bad guys knew what the operating system could do and what the operating system couldn't do. They knew its weaknesses. They could work over time to chip away at those. And while we could release security updates to try to patch those issues as we would find them, we weren't making any real substantial changes to the operating system overall. Those substantial changes only came with new releases. Now that we're doing new releases every six months and delivering new security features every six months, those protection gaps pretty much disappear. And as a result, we think that the the hackers and the bad guys out there will go after easier targets, trying to continually find additional ways of exploiting an OS that's being updated with new security features every six months is hard work. It's much easier to go after easier targets. So what's the easier target? It's the end user. It's not the operating system. We're seeing that shift already with people trying to trick people into giving them information rather than trying to break into the operating system and steal it. So as we adapt and as we see those patterns coming through, we'll start to add more features into the operating system to try to help with that as well. But it's already altering the behavior of people who are trying to find these exploits. So you can expect to see every new Windows release will have a new set of security capabilities. We'll never have a Windows 10 release that doesn't add at least one new security feature because we need to be able to stay ahead of the, the bad guys. It's not just a few hackers in a basement somewhere. Instead, it's entire nation states of thousands of people trying to do these coordinated efforts to impenetrate your systems. So that's the new normal being able to stay ahead, being able to add new security capabilities to try to uh, stay ahead of the hackers. We've also seen a big change in the hardware as well. It used to be that we could do a new Windows release, and as long as you had drivers, you were set to go. Windows was good. But now there's such a tight interaction between Windows and the hardware that it's running on that that doesn't work anymore. In order to get the best battery life, the best performance out of the device and the best capabilities out of the features of the hardware, we need to make continued tweaks to the operating system. These continued tweaks mean that we have to release a new version of Windows to support new generations of hardware. I mean, that's the basis of our silicon support policy. We've recognized that in order to keep up with the hardware innovations while getting you the best battery life, the best security, and everything else, that we need to continually evolve Windows to support the latest hardware. So if we didn't do releases every six months, we wouldn't be able to support the new hardware that's coming out every six months with Intel, AMD, and others continually releasing new innovations. We have to be able to keep up. That brings us to the biggest change. I mean, the biggest change overall is how do you change the way you deploy this? 
Because obviously doing the traditional deployment project that you've done every three to five years and now trying to do it every six months doesn't work. You had to change the process. You had to change the way you go about doing this so that this becomes as automated as possible, as easy as possible, and as low cost as possible. If we're going to go from deploying once every five years to twice per year, which is the rhythm that we want to get into, that's 10 times as fast. In order to deploy 10 times as fast, you need to deploy at about one-tenth of the cost. In order to do that, we need to shrink these big components of a deployment process down to something much more manageable. That includes app testing, infrastructure updates, uh, image creation, and the deployment process itself. We need to chip away at each one of those and make each one of them simpler. We'll talk more about how we want to do that, but uh, that becomes the biggest change for organizations is adopt, adapting your existing processes to support this new model. We've already got over 500 million machines running on Windows 10. That includes a lot of consumer devices as well as commercial devices. We've been working with a lot of enterprise customers to get the adoption of Windows 10 in the enterprise space. And we started to hear back from some of these customers who are going through this motion that have implemented Windows as a service. Companies like Kimberly Clark, a paper company in the US, who said that they've implemented Windows as a service and it's reduced their operating system deployment time by 75%. Which we've said, that's ah, a pretty good first step, but it's not quite where we want it to be. We're still trying to get the wheel moving faster. We need to be able to deploy twice per year if we were deploying every five years prior, 10 times as fast, we would hope to see 90% savings in the deployment time and the other deployment costs. So we know that we still have work to do and we're still working on enhancing Windows as a service overall and the pieces that go into that from a technology perspective to reduce those costs even more because we want it to be kind of break even over time. If you looked at the big deployment project as the spike on the graph of your costs for keeping Windows up to date, we really just want to turn it over onto its side now. And you have a continual set of costs without those big spikes every three to five years. We talked to another customer who didn't want their name to be used who said, hey, we upgraded a third of our devices from Windows 10 1607 to Windows 10 1703 in three business days. They just pushed the button and said, let's go. No issues, no support calls, no application compatibility issues, everything just worked. I mean, that's what we'll get to eventually as we work out all the kinks, as we get into this rhythm, as we work with ISVs and customers to adopt this Windows as a service model. So we want to get into a rhythm where we're keeping Windows always up to date. Two feature updates per year, every six months. We want to change the way you deploy these feature updates, moving away from the traditional wipe and load image-based process to a, a much simpler servicing-based process. We think that would typically go through a three-phase implementation. You want to be able to plan and prepare for what's coming next by looking at insider preview builds and seeing the new features that we're adding, using those insider builds to make sure that your apps and infrastructure are still compatible, and identifying the new features so that you can start to see how would we deploy these features inside of the organization. You would then move into a set of pilot deployments after we do a release. So we just released Windows 10 1709. You would start doing pilot deployments of that to validate that all of your apps work, that your devices work fine with that release, and that your infrastructure is fully compatible with that release. React to any issues that you encounter, and then at the same time, hopefully implement some of the new features that we've released. Now, some of those features don't have to be implemented at the same time that you do the deployment. Like if we release a new feature like Windows Defender Application Guard, it doesn't have to be turned on from day one. So you could deploy and then say that you're going to turn on the new features later. 
but uh, it is convenient while you're doing this pilot activity to try to enable as many of those features as possible. After a period of time, which could take two months, four months, six months, depending on your organization, you should then be ready to broadly deploy, that you've validated all of your apps, all of your infrastructure, all your devices, everything's looking good, now we just want to open it up to the broadest population. At that point, the focus is much more on risk reduction for that deployment rather than validating all the apps and infrastructure because all that work's already been done. So in the broad deployment phase, we might say, let's do half of the accounting department rather than the whole accounting department at once. So we'll do half, we'll make sure that we don't run into any other uh, unexpected issues, and then maybe a few weeks later we do the other half. That's the type of risk reduction that we want to do during the broad deployment phase. So the basic flow always starts out with planning and preparing using insider preview builds. Those could be used on lab machines, certainly, but we hope to get you to expand that usage outside of the lab and use it even on your IT devices that you use for day-to-day -day activities. Use it in the real world. See how it works. Try out the new capabilities. Get a feel for the compatibility and the stability of the operating system. If you run into issues, submit feedback through the feedback hub to let us know about those issues so that we can try to address as many of those as possible while we're still in active development for this release. That gets you ready then for the targeted pilots that can happen after the release, again to about 10 to 20 percent of the machines in the organization, where you're trying to pick the right selection of machines to get that 10 percent to cover 90 percent of the applications. So we want to pick these people appropriately and ideally get them to volunteer for the process so that we're covering the largest percentage of apps and when they run into issues, they'll pick up the phone and call you and let you know about them. So this is a big shift from where we typically did testing of every app and every piece of infrastructure up front before we deployed the first machine to instead saying, let's just assume it's going to work. Let's deploy and try to prove otherwise. I mean, in order for that to work, we need to have very high levels of compatibility. We need to have some good assurances that things are just going to work. And that's what we've been striving to get in place with Windows 10. It's not to say it's going to be perfect. You're still going to run into issues. But the hope is that these issues are identified during these targeted pilots prior to the broad deployments. And then you can react to those issues as you find them. All of that then is to prepare for the rest of the organization to deploy to the general population of PCs that remaining 80 to 90 percent of the devices in the organization. So the changes that I've mentioned as we've gone through that are to the application validation process, to the infrastructure updating process, keeping your infrastructure ready for Windows 10, and to the deployment process that you use for Windows 10. From an application validation perspective, this really becomes the biggest change. You need to move from a proactive test everything model to instead using a reactive let's deploy and see what happens model. Yeah, we can still do proactive testing of the most critical applications. If it's an app that would cause your business to fail if it doesn't work, you're not going to say we, we're just going to deploy and try it. Instead, you're going to do some upfront testing of those applications. But hopefully, you could do that in parallel to the initial pilot deployments to, say, the IT organization or to other less critical parts of the company. So you pr proactively test a small percentage of the applications and then reactively validate the rest by deploying to people who use those apps and seeing what happens. Now, in order for that really to work, you do need to make sure that you have some remediation plans in place, like what happens if the application doesn't work. You don't want to be caught off guard. You want to be able to provide options to the end user to say, uh, maybe we'll roll back to the previous Windows 10 release. Maybe we'll give you a machine that you can use temporarily to run that application. 
Maybe we have access to a virtual machine or a, a VDI session that they can use to run that application instead, or a remote desktop host. So you need to have some type of plan in place just in case something goes wrong during that pilot process. But the hope is that that's a, a pretty small number of uh, incidents because we're talking about 99% compatibility overall. That does mean 1% failures. You are going to find some applications that may have issues, but the hope is that we can resolve those issues pretty quickly, either through shimming or through uh, a simple update provided from the vendor. We do have some tools to help with that. Windows Analytics and Ready for Windows are two key tools that fit into this. Ready for Windows lets us see support statements from ISVs for the different Windows 10 releases. Windows Ready also provides usage information. Looking at that 500 million device pool and telling you these versions of this application are in use on a significant number of those machines. So you're not going to bother testing Adobe Reader version X if you can see through Ready for Windows that that same version is used by millions of machines already running Windows 10. Instead, you're going to focus on the apps that either don't have enough usage data or are specific line of business apps that aren't seen outside of your organization. So you can use the data provided through Ready for Windows to focus your testing on what's really important. We can then pull all of that Ready for Windows data as well as your inventory of all the apps in, in use inside of your organization into a solution called Windows Analytics. You can enable Windows Analytics in your organization and we'll gather up all of that data, combine it with the Ready for Windows data as well as known incompatibility information that we use as part of our upgrade process to block upgrades on machines that have issues. And we show that back to you. Here are all your devices that are ready to deploy because we can't see any issues in Ready for Windows or in the compatibility database of issues that we track. Here are devices that have known issues that you need to take some action to remediate. Or here are some devices that uh, we're not sure about because those particular applications aren't in heavy use outside of your organization. So it lets you drill in and focus on what's more important. Overall, we expect desktop applications, the majority of them will just work. Most of the organizations that we've talked to are seeing compatibility rates around 99%, which isn't perfect, but it's pretty good overall compared to previous releases going from Windows XP to Windows 7 or uh, even from 7 to 8.1, the rates were higher. So we're seeing improvements because we put a lot more emphasis on maintaining that compatibility. And we do that by just not changing things. I mean, the Win32 APIs that these apps build on top of aren't changing from release to release. If we don't change them, as long as the developers follow the rules, the app should continue to work. We also watch for feedback through Insider Preview as well as kind of inferred feedback that we can see through our insider telemetry. Uh, a good example is if we release an insider preview build and we see that a particular application changes in behavior from one insider release to the next release, like if we saw it being used two hours per day on average before the build and only 30 seconds afterwards, it's a pretty good sign something's going wrong with that application it's probably crashing or in some way it's not working the same way that it did before. So we can then either reach out to the ISV and say, hey, something's up with your application, or we can just go get a copy of that application ourselves and install it and see if we can figure it out. So we're trying to be a lot more proactive on identifying those sorts of issues and fixing them during the insider preview process so that by the time we do a release, you don't even see that these problems have happened. On the web side, we generally recommend that organizations have a dual browser strategy. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but basically using Edge as the primary browser for all modern HTML5-based websites and falling back to IE11 just for 
the websites that require uh, compatibility with older versions of IE. Most of you are probably running IE 11 on top of Windows 7 today using enterprise mode. So you're 90% of the way there already. The biggest change moving to Windows 10, we would suggest taking the compatible set, the parts, the pieces that don't have explicit compatibility mode entries in enterprise mode, and just have those run in Edge, and then use IE for all of the other incompatible applications. We've made it as easy as possible in Windows 10 to switch back and forth seamlessly so that the end user doesn't need to know, for this web page, I need to go over here. For this web page, I need to go over there. We'll figure out this one needs Edge, this one needs IE, and we'll route it appropriately. So pretty good overall on the website. With modern applications, most of you aren't running significant numbers of them, so we don't have to worry too much about those. But we can validate those because we've got hundreds of thousands of them in the store to try out. On the hardware side, Windows 10 has the same hardware requirements as Windows 7. So basically, any machine that you have running Windows 7 will run Windows 10 just fine. Uh, there can be some driver updates that are needed. Windows Analytics will help you identify those as well. You can have Windows Analytics inventory all of your Windows 7 devices and tell you these devices have driver issues. You need to update the driver to a newer version before you deploy. So overall, we're in pretty good shape on the hardware side. Most of the concern generally is around desktop applications, which is where we get into more of the focus. First on Ready for Windows, which we talked about a little before and then feeding that same information into Windows Analytics. How many of you tried out Ready for Windows? Not too many. It's a really easy website to use, so I definitely recommend that you try it out. Uh, let me see if I can bring up an example here just to show you. Get rid of some of these tabs. Go to readyforwindows.com. Where we can see a couple of things at a glance. We can see the most common applications that most organizations care about, which are antivirus software, VPN clients, and virtualization software. So if you look at those categories, you can quickly see at a glance the compatibility information for the, the current releases of Windows. So that's good, but if we wanted to find something more specific, we can just search for it. So I could search for Citrix, see a list of applications from Citrix, and then drill into one of those. So we can see Citrix says Citrix Receiver is supported on Windows 10. And then we can see all the different versions of Citrix that are in use in the real world and which ones have insufficient data, meaning that it's not a very common version that's out there, which versions are highly adopted, and even which versions have a known compatibility issue. So we can put a note in there saying, contact the software provider. There's something that needs to be done to fix this application for uh, Windows 10. So that's the core information that's in Ready for Windows. We then take that information and pull it into Windows Analytics. Windows Analytics then provides an upgrade readiness component that shows you all your devices, all of the applications on those devices, and matches them with all of the Ready for Windows data to show you which apps need remediation, which ones are probably good to go. It's a free service. You just need to sign up for it uh, and do some things to enable telemetry in your organization. First, you need to tag all your machines to say, these machines belong to me. There's a commercial ID that gets generated that needs to be put onto each of the machines so that we can then take the telemetry from your machines and present it to you through Windows Analytics. Windows Analytics builds on top of Azure OMS, the Operations Management Suite. Uh, but we cover all of the costs for this. So it's a free service, easy to sign up for. We also have a couple of additional analytics components that actually just released last week. Uh, update compliance is useful for reporting against uh, patch levels. So we can look at the machines and make sure that they've got the latest 
cumulative updates applied, that they're running supported feature updates, even that they're using the latest antivirus definitions. So we'll show you that information uh, through a simple dashboard. The third one that we've been working on, device health, is really designed to move much more into the proactive support phase of being able to tell you that things are going wrong in your environment before anyone's even told you about it. So before that first help desk call has occurred, we can tell you that things aren't right. These machines are crashing. These drivers are crashing. These apps are crashing. These uh, startup times are too long. These logon times are too long. So we can let you drill in and see what's going on in your environment before the help desk calls start. So all of those tools together are Windows Analytics. Uh, definitely check that out through the uh, Windows Analytics page, which gives you the links to sign up and additional technical documentation on uh, how to implement this. So I mentioned before, upgrade readiness pulls together inventory from your organization, the ready for Windows data about compatibility and known issues and remediation for those, as well as usage information and ties that with our compatibility database to tell you these apps don't work. So you can then use that to drill in and figure out which devices to uh, focus on. So it tries to walk you through the process step by step, getting you ready for doing not only the initial deployment to get you from Windows 7 to Windows 10, but also then each of the feature updates to Windows 10 after that. So you would keep checking back to Windows Analytics to see now, what do I need to take care of before I'm ready to move to the next release? Hopefully, it'll be a very small list after that first time that maybe it just tells you, oh, by the way, there's a semantic antivirus update that needs to be deployed, or there's an update to Citrix receiver, or there's an update to your VPN client. Whatever it might be, it tells you, here are the steps that you need to take. Here's a link to the vendor's information for that so that you can quickly get those out of the way so that you can quickly move into pilot deployments and then into broad deployment. Again, on the web side, we want you to focus on using Edge. It's the safest, fastest, most productive default browser. But then we've got IE around for the older stuff. So we can redirect from Edge to IE using the Enterprise Mode Site List. You just define the list of sites that you want. What we added in Windows 10 1607 then was another policy that says, if this is a web page that someone's trying to use in IE that doesn't require IE, push it back over to Edge. So we make sure that the user always ends up in the right browser for the web page that they're trying to use. So let's shift to infrastructure then. In the past, when we have released new versions of Windows, we tended to also require updates to Config Manager and to Windows Server and to Active Directory and all this other stuff. So we've tried to simplify that as much as possible. Config Managers moved to a very simple updating model where every, th every four months they have a new release to deploy that new release, you just go into the Config Manager console, right click on their servicing node, find the new entry, and just say to install it. They'll upgrade your entire hierarchy for you. So they take care of everything. On the Active Directory and Windows Server side, we've tried to break the dependency there so that deploying a new Windows 10 release doesn't require touching anything on Windows Server. The only exception might be new group policy objects that we've added to Windows 10, so you may need to update your central policy store with the new GPO templates so that you can define those new Windows 10 settings. But other than that, we want it to be really simple to drop this new Windows 10 release into your environment. Of course, that assumes that you still want to do this infrastructure yourself. If you want to, you can move entirely to the cloud. You can switch to Azure Active Directory use Intune and use Windows Update for Business and not worry about any of that. You don't need Windows Server anymore. You don't need Configuration Manager. You can use all of this straight from the cloud. Now, for a lot of customers, that's kind of the, a future-looking direction, that that's going to take some time before they could get there. But there are customers who are making that move today and are successfully doing that. 
they don't have any infrastructure at this point, except for maybe a DHCP server and uh, an internet gateway so that the machines are able to connect to the cloud and get their services from there. We did make some announcements at Ignite talking about co-management as a way of starting to make those steps toward the cloud uh, in smaller increments. So maybe you want to use Config Manager and Intune together as a way to provide a bridge to go from what you're doing today to a true cloud-based scenario at some point in the future. So we are enabling more stepping stones to help you down that path. But uh, it's something to think about. For a lot of customers, that still looks like something that's far off in the distance, and maybe it will be. But there are customers who are successfully making that move now. As I mentioned, you could right-click in Config Manager in the console. You'll see the new update show up. You just right-click and choose to install that update pack, and they'll take care of everything for you. Where it gets to be a little bit more interesting is how do you leverage the tools to do this deployment? So everyone probably has a pretty good idea of how to go from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Most of you probably look at that and say, well, we'll do that the same way as what we've done in the past to go from, say, Windows XP to Windows 7. So that's well known. But how do you do this every six months? There are a variety of things that can be done to make this simpler, including creating a ringed-based process. Rings are really nothing more than groups of machines where we want to define a group, deploy to that group, expand out to the next group, expand out to the group after that. When you look at that, it just looks like a series of concentric rings as you expand out inside of your organization. So you create those rings and you deploy to them one at a time, each time measuring what happens and reacting to any issues that come up. These updates are kind of large as well. So a lot of concerns have been raised around the impact on the network. So we've always recommended that customers set up peer-to-peer -peer technologies to help with that. We've got a variety of them. Uh, branch cache, delivery optimization, config manager peer caching, various third-party products can hook in as well. So using one of those reduces the impact on the network overall. We can try to schedule the updates so that they don't impact the user. Ideally, we want to do these when there's no user sitting in front of the machine because each one of these feature updates takes about 30 to 90 minutes when it installs on a machine and then we can implement new features uh, as part of this process. So when we look at this from a ring perspective, we get into this rhythm of starting with the insider preview builds, which hopefully we can deploy to most of the IT organization, then expand out at the point of release to say, now let's find ourselves some canary testers, the early adopters, the people who really like technology and are willing to help IT, provide feedback to IT about the new versions. After they've effectively signed off by not reporting back any new issues, then we can expand out to people who want to voluntarily sign up. Maybe they can use a self-service mechanism to request a new feature update to be installed. And after that, we need to expand into more of a sampling approach to get coverage of the biggest percentage of applications. Like it doesn't do us any good if all of our pilot participants are from one department of the company, because then you don't get broad coverage of the apps. We need to get a, a, a good sampling from each part of the company to get the broadest set of applications covered. After we're through those pilot deployments, we reach a decision point. We make a decision that says, we're now ready to deploy this broadly. And at that point, open the floodgates. Now let's deploy as quickly as we possibly can to the rest of the organization so that we can then continue to use this until the next cycle comes around because this is a continual process that we're going through every six months. We have various tools that can help with the deployment process for feature updates, those every six month releases. You can point all your machines directly at the cloud using Windows Update and we'll take care of updating them just like we do the 500 million plus consumer machines out there. Most of you probably want a little bit more control than that. 
So we've provided Windows Update for business, which gives a set of policies that layer on top of Windows Update to let you specify this group of machines should get the update on day zero, this group on day 30, this group on day 90, this group on day 120, and you just sit back and watch. We'll make sure to implement, to deploy on the right day to each of those groups of machines. Of course, you've got the existing on-prem solutions as well. If you're using WSUS or Config Manager, both of them provide the ability to do the same thing, where you can set up your rings inside of the product and let WSUS or Config Manager take care of the deployment. In WSUS, generally, these rings are implemented through computer groups. And once you've defined the computer group, you may need to manually approve each one. In the case of Config Manager, you could do this through collections tied to deployments, if you're using task sequences. Or they've also introduced a new Config Manager servicing, a Windows 10 servicing feature that lets you put in similar rules to say, on day 0, on day 30, on day 90, here's the groups that I want to deploy. Windows Update, servicing from the cloud, tied with Windows Analytics to measure compliance and progress. Uh, it's a good set of technologies to use if you're going to move into that cloud first way of looking at things. System Center Configuration Manager basically provides two options. Task sequences, which gives you additional control to do pre- and post-processing. So a lot of customers prefer the task sequences because it lets them do things like uh, install application patches, install the latest VPN client, install the latest antivirus software, tying that into the upgrade process. If you don't have any of those requirements, then the Windows 10 servicing capability lets you define servicing plans that automates all of that. Again, you just put it into autopilot. If you don't run into any issues, you just let Config Manager continue to deploy to the next groups. The nice thing about the servicing-based approach and WSUS is that both of them use a different type of media to do the deployments, and that media is smaller. If we look at task sequences, in order to use a task sequence to do a feature update, we had to download the ISO from the Volume License Servicing Center. That ISO is about 3.5 gigabytes. We deploy that 3.5 gigabytes out to each machine as part of the feature update deployment. If we use a servicing-based approach, it's only 2.5 gigabytes because it's packaged in a different way that gets rid of some of the extra space requirements, and it actually compresses it differently as well. So we can get down to 2.5 gigabytes by moving to a servicing-based approach. Next year, we'll shrink that even more. We want to do a, an express feature update. And as part of that express update, we recognize that between one Windows release and the next, there are files that don't change. So we won't download the pieces that haven't changed. And we expect that to reduce the size by about another 35%. So rather than 2.5 gigabytes downloaded, maybe it's only 1.8 gigabytes downloaded per machine. Still big, which is why we always talk about peer-to-peer -to -peer tools, but we are continuing to chip away at the size and trying to make it more manageable. I mentioned peer-to-peer -to -peer tools. I mean, generally, they all have the same goal. The goal is to take the traffic that would normally flow back into the data center to your distribution points, to your servers, through your core switches, and push it out to the edges of the network so that you can have one or a small number of machines download those bits and then share them with all the other clients. So it pushes all of that network traffic out to the edges. With WSUS and Config Manager, we can use Branch Cache. Branch Cache has been built into Windows for years. It's easy to turn on. There's just a couple of policies to configure and a server role that needs to be installed on all your distribution points. Once that's done, the clients are smart enough to say, before I go to download this chunk of content from the server, see if it's available on a peer that is nearby. So it sends out a broadcast saying, I'm about to download this chunk of data. Does anyone have it? And if anyone replies back, it will grab that chunk before it goes to the server. Delivery optimization is a new technology that we introduced in Windows 10. Similar in concept, different in implementation. 
rather than the client sending out a broadcast asking anybody got this chunk of data, instead, the client will reach out to a web service running on the internet and say, I'm about to download content from this URL. Are there any clients on my local network that have already done that? So the service replies back with a list saying, yeah, all of these clients have already grabbed the content. See if you can get it from one of those. So they'll try then to get it from the other clients. And if they can't, well, then they'll fall back to getting it from the server or downloading it from the internet, whatever is appropriate. That works with Windows Update, Windows Update for Business. That also works with WSUS. So if you've deployed Windows 10, uh, that's probably already enabled for your Windows 10 devices that they will reach out to the delivery optimization service and try to do a peer-to-peer -peer transfer before they'll go to the WSUS server and try to download it from there. Config Manager peer caching was built into the latest Config Manager current branch release. Basically, it's designed to do the same thing, but at a Config Manager client level. So the Config Manager client downloads a particular package from a distribution point, where that package could be a cumulative update, it could be a feature update, could be an application, doesn't really matter what it is. Before the next client goes to download it, it will ask the management point, hey, are there any peers nearby me within my boundaries where I can grab this content instead? So it effectively can turn every Config Manager client into a distribution point. They're all willing to share the content with all the other Config Manager clients. Config Manager also provides support for alternate content providers where these alternate content providers are basically third-party packages that hook into Config Manager and take over the content distribution function. There are two prevalent ones out there, but uh, you can try them out. They provide more advanced capabilities beyond what most of the inbox Microsoft tools provide. Obviously, there's a cost involved with those where the solutions we provide are free, but it, it just depends on what your requirements are. We really don't care which peer-to-peer -peer solution you set up, other than set up one. You need to have some sort of peer-to-peer -peer mechanism in place to make the movement of these bits through your network much more efficient. With any of these in place, we can shift a significant percentage of the traffic away from the data center, away from the distribution points, and out to the edges of the network. Generally, they're pretty easy to set up, uh, so there's no reason not to implement one of these. We should then talk a little bit about quality. So everything I've talked about for the most part as we've gone through this has been focused on those every six month feature updates. But we also change the way we do monthly patching. When we talk about these monthly patches, we talk about these monthly patches as quality updates. So that's what we're talking about when we say maintaining quality. We want to move to a simpler model with Windows 10, where every month we release a single cumulative update that contains all the fixes for Windows 10 for that release up to that point in time. So for those of you who feel the pain every time you take a new machine and deploy Windows 7 SP1 to it and then patch it to get it up to date, you might have to install 200 sp separate patches to get the machine current. With Windows 10, the most updates you would ever need to install is one, because that one update contains all the fixes that we've ever released for that version of Windows 10. So it's a much simpler model overall. It's really designed to solve this particular problem. We had on Windows 7, uh, customers who would selectively patch. Generally, they'd deploy every security update that we released, but maybe none of the non-security updates, or maybe only the non-security updates that actually impacted them, where they noticed the issue and called support and got the fix and installed it. So we had every single Windows 7 machine out there with a slightly different set of patches installed on it. But what we tested inside of our validation labs before we would release the next set on Patch Tuesday wasn't anything like that. Instead, we would test on a fully patched Windows 7 machine. And guess what? Everything would work great.
But then that patch would be used in the real world where we would see that randomly patched machine, and it might not work ex as expected. Machine might blue screen, or there could be other issues introduced that when we would try would work just fine with our testing. So we knew that that caused all kinds of quality and stability issues. That's why we changed the model with Windows 10 to say instead of doing these separate patches, we're going to roll them all together into a cumulative update, and everyone is going to be running the exact set of fixes. We don't do private hot fixes anymore for Windows 10. If we do a fix, we make it available to everyone. So we want that level of consistency. We want every single Windows 10 machine as of Patch Tuesday in October to all be running exactly the same code. We do have some scenarios where we look at this and say, yeah, Windows as a service and delivering new capabilities and new features every six months is great, but there are some special purpose devices out there where this doesn't work. So we do have support for those. We still have the, the general purpose device, which we think m for most organizations is the significant percentage of the devices that are in place. But in some limited use cases, we want to be able to do something different. For these special purpose devices, like uh, industrial control devices and medical control devices and uh, some embedded IoT type use cases, we want to provide a version of Windows where nothing changes for the life of the device. No new functionality, no new features, no changes at all. Basically, kind of going back to the old model, where once you've installed that version of Windows, nothing is going to change until that machine is retired. That's where the long-term servicing channel comes in. We will do long-term servicing releases of Windows 10 about every three years, and those can be used for these scenarios. We actually make these long-term servicing channel bits available to two different channels. We make them available to system builders, VARs, and OEMs who will pre-install this on devices before they ship them to you. Generally, in those cases, they're responsible for the OS that's running on those machines, and they'll continue to service them. But you as an organization, as long as you have an enterprise agreement with Windows 10 Enterprise E3 or E5 subscriptions, will provide you the same capabilities. You can deploy the exact same bits to the device yourself. The only real difference between the two is for those IoT embedded use cases, there are licensing restrictions that say this can only be used to run the special purpose software that's on that device. No general purpose software is allowed. Where in the enterprise case, you can run whatever you want on the device. We did a release in 2015. That was our first long-term servicing release. We did another one in 2016. Well, that doesn't quite match the three-year release schedule, but uh, we did the 2016 one because it aligned with Windows Server 2016. And the server releases are effectively long-term servicing releases themselves. And since there's a lot of shared code between server and client, if we're going to do a server long-term release, we might as well do a client long-term release at the same time. So that's why we did another LTSB release at that point, now LTSC. Uh, the next one's not expected until 2019. So back on that three-year release schedule. These are designed when there can be absolutely no changes for the life of the device. We will support these for 10 years including five years of standard servicing and then five years of uh, security-only uh, extended servicing. We remove all features from the OS that could change any time during that process, any time during that 10-year life. That's why we don't include Edge. We don't include Cortana, the Windows Store, any of the inbox apps. They have to be updated more frequently than that. Because if, they're, if they aren't updated more frequently than that, they have a tendency to stop working. So we wanted to make sure that everything that's included in the OS is stable and never changes and continues to work for that full 10-year period. The biggest thing, though, is these, this isn't really intended for information worker devices. It's really only intended for those special use cases, 
So we don't see the long-term servicing channel being used that broadly. One of the challenges that some of the customers have run into where they've said, oh yeah, well, we understand, we're gonna take our chances, we're gonna deploy LTSC broadly. What they found is that there are some challenges like hardware support. Remember before I talked about how we would add support for new generations of hardware by doing a new Windows release because the, the silicon keeps evolving, therefore Windows needs to keep evolving. Well, if the last release of the long-term servicing came out in 2016, that would mean no support for any new hardware that's been released since 2016. So when Intel's new processors start coming out later this year, LTSC wouldn't support it until 2019. So then customers would start asking questions like, well, does that mean that we had to stockpile older machines to run these special purpose use cases? Potentially, yes, if you intend to run that version of Windows on a device that's going to go through 2019, when the next version of Windows comes out, you better make sure that you have the hardware that's capable of running that. Now, fortunately, most of the OEMs will make available that hardware because they also want to be able to support Windows 7 on their new hardware, so they will continue to sell devices that will run Windows 7. And if it runs Windows 7, it will run the LTSC release as well. But uh, as we move forward into the future and Windows 7 disappears from the picture, uh, this becomes a, a much more serious concern for most customers. For IoT space, where you've got these special use devices inside of a factory, saying that you're going to buy machines now and you're going to use them for the next 10 years and you're going to stock spares and all that good stuff, quite normal. That's the normal way of doing business for those types of devices, but definitely not for information worker devices. So next steps then. We have published a lot of documentation around Windows as a service. If you go to aka.ms slash WAS, W-A-A-S, that's the main documentation repository where all of our docs around Windows as a service can be found. So definitely check that out. We did a five-minute video where we kind of walked through the, the basics of Windows as a service uh, on, on YouTube. So the WAS video link will take you to that one. If you are interested in looking at Windows Analytics and Ready for Windows, you can go to the Windows Analytics page or the Ready for Windows page and check those out. Ready for Windows is easy. Just go in and search for whatever you want. Windows Analytics requires a sign-up process, but it is free. We also have introduced a program called Fast Track. So if you want to check out Fast Track, you can go to fasttrack.microsoft.com. The idea here is that we have a set of technical experts who know how to deploy Windows, how to deploy Office, how to use EMS, how to use all of these tools together, and they will help guide you through the deployment and implementation process. From the initial proof of concept all the way through the final deployment. So they try to guide you through this whole thing. So if you're looking for assistance with something like that, let them know they can be engaged to help with that. In some cases, they provide support through partners where the partners are, are available on site to help with those efforts. In other cases, they can support you remotely through the fast track uh, centers. And with that, we can wrap it up. Just try it out. Deploy Windows 10, deploy Office 365, start implementing this Windows as a service process where you have a strategy for keeping these releases flowing. Every six months, the new release comes out, you deploy it. Leverage those Windows Insider builds so that you can see what's coming next. Turn on telemetry, use Windows Analytics so that you can use that information to guide you through the process and move away from the test everything model and instead focus much more on validation. Deploy out to real world machines, see what happens, get the feedback, react to the feedback, move to the next group. That's the process that you'll need to implement in order to make this successful. Thanks a lot for listening to me. I have another session tomorrow talking about deployment, so hopefully I'll see a lot of you there too. Thanks.